Hello everyone, welcome to History Savvy. In today's episode, I'm going to be looking at the War of 1812 by Crash Course, and this appears to be number 11 of their U.S. History series. And I've not had anything really to do with Crash Course. Uh, I think I may have seen one or two of their videos in the very distant past, but I'm excited to see their interpretation of this event. Um, I myself know a little bit about the War of 1812, so let's just jump right into it. Hi, I'm John Green, this is Crash Course U.S. History, and today we're going to talk about what America's best at, war. <laughs> uh, Mr. Green, the United States has actually only declared war five times in the last 230 years. Oh, me from the past, you sniveling literalist. Well, <laughs> I mean, when somebody like that spouts a fact like that, I tend to believe him out of the gate. Today we're going to talk about America's first declared war, the War of 1812, so-called because historians are terrible at naming things. I mean, they could have called it the Revolutionary War Part Du, or the Canadian Cataclysm, or the War to Facilitate Future Wars. But no, they just named it after the year it started. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it's a fair name, honestly. What else? I mean, what would you name the War of 1812 or rename the War of 1812? I guess if you have an idea, just... Bloop, bloop that down in the comments. I'd, I'd be interested to know. But Revolutionary War Part 2, that's an appropriate name, I'd say. You know, I know a lot of people like to refer to the American Revolutionary War as uh, the War of American Independence, and that's, I think, a very British way of putting it. Um, but calling it the, the War of Independence is not wrong. It's not inaccurate. But it does shift uh, the essential idea of that war, which was that it was a revolutionary event. And that's, in fact, what the Revolutionary War was. We went from having a government uh, headed by a monarchy to a government uh, based in a republican system. So that in itself is, is revolutionary, and it was done as a result of a war. So although you can call it the War of American Independence, that's fine. I think the best name for that war is the American Revolutionary War because that really captures what that war was all about, at least from the American perspective. I know this disappoints the military historians among you, but as usual, we're going to spend more time talking about the causes and effects of the war. Okay, <clears throat> so anytime I see a political cartoon, I really like to look at it if I can, because this is a direct connection with somebody in the past that really can communicate something about their time period um, without relying upon a historian to interpret it for us or anything like that. So this is, a, this is a way we can directly connect with the past. So what we've got here is a lady, she's saying, I tell you, Johnny, you must learn to read, respect, free trade, seamen's rights, and see, etc. probably. As for you, Monsieur Beau Napperty, when John gets his lesson by heart, I'll teach you respect, retribution, etc., etc. And then in the middle, we've got Napoleon, because he's short and dressed in French clothes with a tricolor. He's saying, ha ha. And I love that he's saying, ha ha. That's how that's spelled out, just like what we would do today. It's, it's fun. Shows you how uh, little people change sometimes. Anyway, ha ha. Beggar me be glad to see Madame Columbia angry with dat der bull. But me no learn respect, me no learn retribution, me be de grand emperor. So clearly Napoleon, who is speaking in very bad English. And on the right here, we've got a man who's saying, I don't like that lesson. I'll read this pretty lesson. And in his hand is a booklet that says, power constitutes right which is another way of saying might makes right so on the left we've got lady columbia representing the united states uh, a popular caricature of america up until world war one napoleon and then a caricature representing england britain in the form of john bull so basically uh 
Napoleon's saying, I'm pleased that the United States is upset with Britain, um, but I see no chance for me to learn respect or experience any kind of retribution or anything like that because I'm the emperor. The United States is chiding Britain for not respecting free trade and seamen's rights. And of course, at this time, free trade was hugely important to the success of the American economy and seamen's rights, sailors' rights. That gets to the heart of the impressment issue as one of the causes of the War of 1812. Um, I do love that she's saying Monsieur Bo Napperty, calling Napoleon Bo Napperty. I don't think I've ever heard that nickname of him, but I like it. And then ultimately Britain saying, you know, you two can get stuffed, might makes right. So a great little political cartoon here, uh, clearly coming from America. Let's see this hat here. The lady Columbia is holding a staff with a hat. Looks kind of like a farmer's hat or a peasant's cat. There's some symbolism there I'm not familiar with, but it would be worth looking into. Anyway, let's continue. The actual, like, killing parts because ultimately it's the ambiguity of the War of 1812 that makes it so interesting. The reason most often given for the War of 1812 was the British impressment of American sailors, whereby American sailors would be kidnapped and basically forced into British servitude. This disrupted American shipping. It also seems like a reasonably obvious violation of American sovereignty, but it's a little more complicated than that. First of all, there were many thousands of British sailors working aboard American ships, so many of the sailors that the British captured were in fact British. Which gets to the larger point that citizenship at but who determines who's British and who's American, you know? Um, if I guess they're just not allowing people to self-identify as British or American. You are, are either British or American if it suits Brit Britain's interests in this case. If you're British, if we want you to be British and we need you in our Navy at the time was a pretty slippery concept, especially on the high seas, like papers were often forged and many sailors identified their supposed Americanness through tattoos of like eagles and flags. Uh, often forged, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to see some numbers on that, if there are any numbers or analysis on, you know, what papers were real versus what papers were forged, how we know what was real and forged at the time. Anyway, it'd be an interesting analysis. And there were several reasons why a British sailor might want to become or pretend to be an American, including that the Brits at the time were fighting Napoleon in what historians, in their infinite creativity, called the Napoleonic Wars. And on that topic, Britain's impressment policy allowed them both to disrupt American shipping to France and to get new British sailors to strengthen their war effort, which was annoying to the Americans on a couple levels, especially the French-loving Republicans, which is a phrase that you don't hear very often anymore. Another reason... <laughs> um. Diving into, you know, the the British Navy, he mentioned it. Let's let's look at it a little more deeply. The British Navy at this time was not a very pleasant place to be. Discipline was harsh, even for very minor disciplinary infractions. Um, they were headed by people who came from the gentry or aristocracy, so there was no guarantee that you were being commanded by somebody who knew what the heck they were doing. Uh, they you know, might have just been there based on their family name and for the need to basically put one of their sons in some kind of prominent position to maintain family honor and, you know, stuff like that. So you're facing severe discipline in the British Navy. Um, they're not healthy places to be and your food's not going to be good. You know, scurvy's a problem. They were still working through why scurvy happens and trying to combat scurvy. Uh, the ships themselves just aren't clean by themselves. You have to really work at keeping ships clean. So you're going to be malnourished, which chances are you were malnourished before, but now you're malnourished um, at the hand of the British monarch, um, and you're living in squalorous conditions, and you have no control or say over what you do if you get off at the next port or, or anything like that. So the British Navy is just not the place to be at this point and impressing people into british navy service is just something that the brits did for a long time even before um it just sometimes would kidnap people to put them on ships to serve in the navy and if i remember correctly they were doing that even under the uh, the reign of the tudors so this is essentially nothing new it's also a cheap way to get people 
into the Navy because, again, empires are seeking to expand their borders, their influence, and doing it in the cheapest way possible. And kidnapping people who already have experience in the task you want them to do is as cost efficient as it can be. So. The reason often given for the war was America's crazy conspiratorial anglophobia. There was even a widespread rumor that British agents were buying up Connecticut sheep in order to sabotage the textile industry, lest you worry that America's fascination with conspiracy theories is new. So those pushing for... <laughs> so, I mean, conspiracy theories have appealed to every society all the time because at the end of the day, people are people. But I think he, he misses the, the broader sort of fear in America at this time. And that's not the fact that Britons have any control in con Connecticut sheep farming. It's that Britons are encouraging Native Americans to resist white settlement, which causes bloodshed and violence and, you know, hurts economies and things like that. So it's, it's that fear that Britons from Canada are encouraging Native American resistance that um, Americans are more concerned about when it comes to the British rather than just sheep farming. For war were known as war hawks, and the most famous among them was Kentucky's Henry Clay. They took the impressment of sailors as an affront to American national honor, but they also complained that Britain's actions were an affront to free trade, by which they meant America's ability to trade with Europeans other than Great Britain. And to be fair, the British were trying to regulate American trade. They even passed the Orders in Council, which required American ships to dock in Britain and pay tax before trading with other European nations. Britain, we were... But that was something that happened after Napoleon said, if any nation trades with Britain, we consider them an enemy nation and we'll seize their ships. So what you've got is Napoleon, France saying, look, if you trade with Britain, you're our enemy. And Britain saying, hey, we're going to use that to our advantage. We're going to force people to trade with us, pay a tax or otherwise get a license to trade with other people in our ports first. So they're, they're forcing people to choose sides in in the conflict between Napoleon and Britain. We're an independent nation. You can't do that kind of stuff. We have a special relationship. It's not that special. But the problem with saying this caused the war is that the orders had been in effect for five years before the war started, and they were rescinded in 1812 before the U.S. declared war, although admittedly we didn't know about it because it didn't reach us until after we declared war. There was no Twitter. Another reason for the <laughs> That's true. They were rescinded. However, the other concerns the Americans had, namely um, that Britons were encouraging Native Americans to fight back, uh, likely would have meant that war would have happened regardless of the uh, rescindance of these orders. So. The war was Canada. That's right, Canada. Americans wanted you. And who can blame them with your excellent health care and your hockey and your first rate national anthem? Stan, this is fun, but enough with the hashtag 1812 problems. According to Virginia. <laughs> it's a little too anachronistic for my tastes, but whatever. And what is what's with the. People is red and green. And... Congressman John Rudolph, agrarian cupidity, not maritime rights. I don't know. Is this something they do regularly? I guess we'll find out. One word. Canada. Canada! Canada! I'm not here to criticize you, John Randolph, but that's actually three words. Now, some historians disagree with this, but the relentless pursuit of new land certainly fits <laughs> in with the Jeffersonian model of an agrarian republic. And there's another factor that figured into America's decision to go to war, expansion into territory controlled by Native Americans. Oh. But going back to Canada, a lot of Americans, uh, prominent Americans, thought that going into Canada would just be an absolute dawdle. Uh, that they were ill-prepared for any conflict with the United States. And they were. Uh, the problem was the United States was ill-prepared for any conflict at all. So it ended up not working out for either side. Oh, it's time for the mystery document? The rules here are simple. Nice. I try to guess the author of the mystery document. Usually I'm wrong and I get shocked. All right, let's see what we got here. You want, by your distinctions of Indian tribes and allotting to each a particular tract of land, to make them to war with each other. You never see an Indian come and endeavor to make the white people do so. It's Tecumseh, drop the mic! Is something that I would do, nice. except that the mic is actually attached to my shirt, so there's no there's no drama in this. I like that they did that, incorporating original documents into a production. That's that's awesome. I really like that. Being able to look at and analyze for yourself original documents is is a key part of 
the craft of history. Clearly a Native American criticism of white people, and I happen to know that that particular one comes from Tecumseh, and I don't get shocked today. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that Americans were continuing to push westward what? into territory where Again, Indians why are they were. making I mean, people goblins? For the Louisiana Purchase, after all. By the beginning of the war, more than 400,000 settlers had moved into territories west of the original 13 colonies, and they outnumbered American Indians by a significant margin. Some Native groups responded with a measure of assimilation. Cherokees like John Ross wanted to become more civilized, that is, more white and farmery, and some of them did even adopt such civilized practices as written languages and slavery. The most civilized practice of all. Uh, people are always like, why aren't you more celebratory of American history? Well, why isn't there more to celebrate? But other <laughs> Indians... There's plenty to celebrate. It just depends on your political persuasions and, and what you choose to focus on. And slavery has been a part of human history for all of human history, practically. ...wanted to resist. The best known of these were the aforementioned Tecumseh and his brother, Tens... Stan, can you just put on the screen? Yes. Let's just enjoy looking at that. Right, that's just for all you visual learners. So he was also known as the Prophet because of his religious teachings and also because of the pronunciation issues. The Prophet encouraged Indians, especially those living in and around the settlement of Prophetstown, to abandon the ways of the whites, primarily in the form of alcohol and manufactured consumer goods. So stop drinking alcohol and eating refined sugars. This guy sounds like my doctor. Tecumseh <laughs> was more middle. That's cute, um, but I don't think cakes or what he was talking about, He's probably talking about more textiles, um, firearms, cooking utensils, things like that, which I, I think is, is, it speaks to an idea that these native peoples were losing their identity as a result of just white encroachment and adopting technologies that, uh, and utensils and tools that they didn't have before. So, Basically, it's decrying a loss of, of identity and culture. Attempting to revive Neolan's idea of pan-Indianism and actively resisting white settlement. As he put it, sell a country? Why not sell the air, the great sea, as well as the earth? Did not the Great Spirit make them all for the use of his children? The Americans responded to this reasonable criticism in the traditional manner, with guns. William Henry Harrison destroyed the native oh, settlement at Prophet's too much of a goblin looking. known as the Battle of Tippecanoe. He would later ride that fame all the way to the presidency in 1840, and then, spoiler alert, he would give the longest inauguration address ever, catch a cold, and die 40 days later. Let that be a lesson to you American politicians. Long speeches? Fatal. So I, just... I, I think the whole thing where he gave a long speech, got a cold, and died because of the speech has been pretty well challenged by serious historians because there's a lot of uh, possibility for intervening factors to cause death, especially in that period. I just painted a pretty negative picture of the Americans' treatment of the Indians because it was awful, but I haven't mentioned how this relates to the War of 1812. The Americans were receiving reports that the British were encouraging Tecumseh, which they probably right. were. And the important thing to remember here is that the War of 1812, like the Seven Years' War and the American Revolution, was also a war against Indians. And as in those other two wars, the Indians were the biggest losers. And not in the cool way of the biggest loser, where like, trainer Bob helps you lose weight, but in the really sad way, where where your entire civilization gets John C. Calhoun. So the War of 1812 was the first time that the United States declared war on anybody. It was also the smallest margin of a declaration of war vote, 79 to 49 in the House and 19 to 13 in the Senate. Northern states, which relied... I'm just thinking about it. I... Conflicts with Native peoples were going on well before this time and well after this time. And so I, I don't think it's exactly fair to highlight conflicts with native peoples um, just in the context of a war with a European nation. Um, these, it, this was happening all the time, you know, because of, of land control and encroachment and things like that. So uh, also treaties, the United States government was also treating with native peoples as foreign governments at this time and later. So to declare war, they would have had to declare war on, you know, the the Pawnee or um, other people. Anyway, let's just move on. I don't trade a lot, didn't want to go to war, while southern and western states, which were more agrarian and wanted expansion to get land for farming and slavery, did. The closeness of the vote reflects a profound ambivalence about the war. As Henry Adams wrote, many nations have gone to war in pure gaiety of the heart, 
But perhaps the United States were the first to force themselves into a war they dreaded in the hope that the war itself might create the spirit they lacked. Don't worry, Henry Adams. In the future, we're going to get pretty gaiety of hardish about war. Anyway, as an actual war, the War of 1812 was something of a farce. Let's go to the thought bubble. The U.S. Army numbered 10 to 12,000, and its officers were sunk into either sloth, ignorance, or habits of intemperate drinking. The U.S. Navy had 17 ships. Great Britain had 1,000. And this lack of like a military, well-drilled military force uh, speaks to a general suspicion of standing armies in the United States at this time, kind of an attitude that lasted through to World War II, I would argue. Um, but probably more practically, the fact is standing armies are expensive to maintain. And it's just a bunch of guys who get bored and drunk and things like that, as you're seeing here. Also, America had very little money. Britain collected 40 times more tax revenue than the U.S. But Britain was busy fighting Napoleon, which is why they didn't really start kicking America's butt until 1814, after Napoleon was defeated. Napoleon's defeat was also the end of the practice of impressment, since Britain didn't need so many sailors anymore. But by this time, the war was already going. It was the War of 1812. <laughs> Initially, much of the war consisted of America's attempts to take Canada, which any map will show you went smashingly. Americans were confident that the Canadians would rush to join the U.S. When marching from Detroit, General William Hull informed the Canadians that, quote, you will be emancipated from tyranny and depression and restored to the dignified station of free men. And the Canadians were like, yeah, we're okay, actually. And so the British in Canada, with their Indian allies, went ahead and captured Detroit and then forced Hull's surrender. America's lack of success in Canada was primarily attributable to terrible strategy. They might have succeeded if they'd taken Montreal, but they didn't want to march through northern New York because it was full of Federalists who were opposed to the war. Instead, they concentrated on the West, that is the area around Detroit, where fighting went back and forth. Also, I think that speaks to the fact that the states at this early period of American history had more power, that a federal army just couldn't walk through a state and, you know, get what it wanted. It had to rely on the good graces of local and state officials and the, and the people themselves to get through. The British found much more success, even seizing Washington, D.C. and burning the White House. In the course of the battle, British Admiral... Well, I mean, that's after the Americans had damaged and sacked and burned places in Canada as well. In fact, there, you know, there's this popular idea that the burning of the White House was in retribution to the burning of governmental buildings in Canada. Um, and that may be true. Uh, it wasn't given as a reason at the time, not by the people who participated in the act, but was given by uh, somebody who was writing about the burning of Washington just a few months after. And everybody kind of latched onto that idea and saw that as, as one of the reasons why. But yeah, the British did take Washington. Um, they, uh, the British commanders went into the White House, enjoyed the dinner that had been prepared for the president, and then torched the joint and did some healthy looting and things like that along the way. Um, and then just a few days after that, there was a possible hurricane. There was a tornado that ripped through. the damage to the British ships um, and to the British army. And I haven't read too much about how that could have changed British uh, war policy in America. I, I would be interested in knowing more about that, actually, how the damage done by the forces of nature changed British plans for pursuing the war in the United States. If you know anything about that, know a good book or something to recommend, Put it down in the comments. Admiral George Cockburn, overseeing the destruction of a newspaper printing house, told the forces that took the city, be sure that all the seas are destroyed so that the rascals cannot any longer abuse my name. <laughs> it's hard out there for a Cockburn. <laughs> Thanks, Thought Bubble. Given these problems, it's amazing there were any American successes, but there were. The battleship USS Constitution broke the myth of British naval invincibility when cannonballs bounced off it and earned it the nickname Old Ironsides. Which Oliver you can Hazard still visit today. Oliver Hazard carried a British fleet in, of all places, Lake Erie. At 
The Battle of the Thames, William Henry Harrison defeated Tecumseh, and the Battle of Horseshoe Bend showed one of the reasons why Indians were defeated when Andrew Jackson played one group of Creeks against another group of Creeks and Cherokees. 800 Indians were killed in that battle. And speaking of Jackson, the most notable American victory of the war was the Battle of New Orleans, which catapulted him to prominence. He lost only 71 men while inflicting 2,036 British casualties. Of course, the most memorable thing about the battle was that it took place two weeks after the peace treaty ending the war had been signed, but hey, that's not Jackson's fault. Again, no. <laughs> Right, it's not his fault. But it also helped Jackson that the British had to march through swamps and heat and things like that, so they were fatigued by the time that they were able, actually able to engage in, in combat. But uh, I guess on the side of Jackson, the United States had not yet ratified the Treaty of Ghent by this point, so technically, I guess, in a way, the, the war was still going on. I... In reality, the war was still going on because the Brits and the Americans in New Orleans still understood the war as on. So anyway, the, the, the Americans ratified the treaty uh, in mid-February. The Britons much sooner, but that's because they were much closer to Ghent. Twitter, hashtag 1815 problems. The Treaty of Ghent, which ended the war, <laughs> proved just how necessary... So here in the middle here, we've got uh, John Quincy Adams. Henry Clay, I think, was also here as well. Um, but not a, you know, a spectacular treaty. The treaty basically just, uh, referred everything back to the way it was before the war, which in a way makes sense, uh, because neither side wins much, neither side loses much. Sorry, the war had been, not at all. No territory changed hands. When negotiations started in August 1814, the British asked for northern Maine, demilitarization of the Great Lakes, and some territory to create an independent nation for the Indians in the Northwest. But none of that happened, not because the U.S. was in a particularly good negotiating position, but because it would have been awkward for Great Britain to carve out pieces of the U.S. and then tell Russia and Prussia that they couldn't take pieces of Europe. Let's see. Napoleon bade farewell to his officers and left Paris for exile on the island of Elba. April 20th, 1814, 1815, Battle of Waterloo, okay. ...for themselves to celebrate their victory in the Napoleonic Wars. There were no provisions in the treaty about impressment or free trade, and basically the treaty returned to everything to the status quo. So neither the U.S. nor Britain actually won, but the Indians, who suffered significant casualties and gave up even more territory, definitely lost. So with a treaty like that, the war must have had a negligible impact on American history, right? Except no, the War of 1812 confirmed that the U.S. would exist. Britain would never invade America again until 1961. <laughs> I mean, the U.S. were good customers, and Great Britain was happy to let them trade as long as that trade wasn't helping a French dictator. The war launched Andrew Jackson's career and solidified the settlement and conquest of land east of the Mississippi River, and our lack of success in Canada reinforced Canadian nationalism while also ensuring that instead of becoming one great nation, we would forever be Canada's pants. The war also spelled the end of the Federalist Party, which tried in 1815 with the Hartford Convention to change the Constitution. In retrospect, the Hartford Convention proposals actually look pretty reasonable. They wanted to eliminate the clause wherein black people were counted as three-fifths of a human and require a two-thirds congressional majority to declare war. But because they had their convention right before Jackson's victory at New Orleans, they only came off looking unpatriotic and out of touch, as the elite so often do. It's hard to argue that Americans really won the War of 18. Even had the war not been on, I think getting those constitutional changes passed would have been impossible, simply due to the fact that um, the slaveholding states still held a, a good deal of power in the American government at this time, and their power would only grow um, up until the Civil War. But we felt like we won, and nothing unleashes national pride like war winning. The nationalistic fervor that emerged in the early 19th century was, like most things, good news for some and bad news for others. But what's important to remember, regardless of whether you're an American, is that after 1812, the United States saw itself not just as an independent nation, but as a big player on the world stage. For better and for worse, that's a gig we've held on to. And no matter how you feel about America's international interventions, you need to remember, it didn't begin in Afghanistan or even Europe it started with freaking Canada. Thanks for watching. So yeah, that was a good video. I guess uh, one final comment on uh, his his narrative there. To say that the United States thought of itself as a, as a big player, I don't think is correct. I think more correct would be to say that America saw itself as a player, a player to be respected, um, and and really nothing more. 
uh, there was, you know, this this idea of we're America, we're going to concern ourselves with our own problems, the Monroe Doctrine and things like that. Uh, we were interested in Europe insofar as we could trade with Europe, you know, and not be like Europe. So say a big player, I think that's a step too far. But on the whole, I thought this was a, a super good uh, distilled version of of War of 1812 and what caused it. It leaves plenty of room to jump off into deeper topics. You know, you could look into the burning and sacking of Washington, look into Tecumseh, which is uh, a subject I find really fascinating um, because it, uh, it it's an idea of pan-Indian, American Indianism that really, I think, is more at home. I get Tecumseh's ideas are more at home in the 20th century than they are in the early 19th century. So Tecumseh, to me, seems way a man of ahead of his time. So Tecumseh's uh, a, a great subject to look deeper into, but uh, I think I will leave it there myself. I'd like to thank you for watching. If you've stuck with me this long, I'd like to say I really appreciate it, and I hope to catch you in the next video. Thanks.